night, everybody. Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you all are doing well. Welcome to Midnight Matter Live, a free variety show where we talk Gundam, gaming, and getting into trouble. I'm, of course, Stephen, aka Midnight Matter, your host, and joining me as always is Gundam Explained host, Adam Blue. How are you doing, my friend? Doing good. Another Wednesday, another talk about I don't know what. <laughs> you do. Actually, I do know. Well, you know, we'll, we'll we'll hop into it. I'm, I'm sure that the thumbnail was something fun for everyone. I, I noticed that my audio wasn't fading out, so I went ahead and manually oh. faded that while we were talking. But you know, that's how it goes with these like technical difficulties. I think last week was a was a big event for all of us with the spring springtide uh, celebration, yeah. and so we did some things on the show that I've never done before, and you know, using new technologies and things like that. So I hope you guys enjoyed that show it was a lot of fun for me and i still need to get in touch with uh tyler lucas so if tyler lucas if you're watching this video email me or hit me up on discord so that i can send you your uh winnings the zeta gundam and the custom decals so today we are going to be talking about last week there was a a little bit of a hullabaloo on twitter there's always a hullabaloo on twitter who am i kidding (laughs) (laughs) like what else is someone there's always somebody mad about something but uh, no, it was, I, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation about, of this, but the Nisaka International Animation Film Festival, um, our yeah. beloved Yoshiyuki Tomino was there and had some interesting comments to say about Char's counterattack. And it got me thinking because, you know, we, we have conversations about this all the time where it's like, you know, sometimes creators can change their mind over time and they say one thing, but then they say another thing later on. And so it'll be interesting to sort of compare some of the things that uh, Tomino has said in the past about Char's counterattack to some of the hot takes that he had on offer last week. Um, oh, yep. I see that the chat is doing well. Hey, everybody. Zionic Shadow, King Dylan, Ultronomous. Hope you guys are doing well. Yeah, um, Zionic Shadow, I am so sorry to hear that your car exploded <laughs> I, yeah, I honestly i thought that that was like the most far-fetched excuse to to miss out on the springtide event i was like come on man you could do better than that say like you know <laughs> your cat ate your ps4 cable or something like that yeah there you go yeah that, but no but then you see he showed the picture and it was like wow <laughs> okay <laughs> all right yeah lesson learned but uh, speaking of Zionic Shadow, let me go ahead and hop into our screen share view because today's episode, as with all the episodes here in March, are is going to be sponsored by Zeke New York, the boys up uh, in the five boroughs. If you have not entered, you know, link down in the description below, at least on YouTube, to the Zeke New York Instagram, you know, tag three friends to enter and enter to win a chance. Uh, what was that? The Gundam Maxter is, is what's on yeah. offer. So that's a good one. Yeah, they, and and I don't know if that one's ever coming back to P Bandai. To be honest with you, probably. You think I've so? Learned, I've learned things eventually come back around. Okay, right. Well, I'll take your word for it. I mean, is it, there I anything think... that you're that you would be waiting to have re released? Like I was waiting for the Spartan the Toads Ritter, and they did. Uh, to me, it seems like UC stuff gets re released pretty frequently. Like the GM Spartan, the the Double O Eighty Eight Zeta, the oh, yeah. you know, the, oh the Turn A Shin. But uh, yeah, G Gundam, I don't know that they've done any re-releases on the the P Bandai uh, G Gundam. I think they did for the Rose Dude. For the Rose? I think they did one, maybe. I could be wrong. But I but I don't know. I think you bring up a good point, though, when you said it's usually you see stuff. It usually, usually is you see stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, enough. speaking of UC stuff and Gumpla, uh, Adam, you dropped a video this morning oh, yeah. going over the Requiem for Vengeance Gumpla kits that we, they didn't even actually show us finished kits. These were CG renderings of the model kits. Were they but, really? I didn't even realize it was CG renderings. Although, yeah, I only saw that like I, you know, as I was kind of zooming in to to critique everything about them, I yeah. was like, wait a second, it says that this is a CG rendering. Um, oh, but yeah, totally if you it. haven't checked that out after the stream, definitely go check out Adam's thoughts on the Gundam and the Zaku Solari. Yeah, they look great. Tons of detail. It, it makes me excited, to be honest. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely going to get that Zaku. I mean, the bunny ear antennas are kind of cool. I to know. Me. Like, I, I, I know it looks kind of goofy because it's not what you typically associate with like a Zaku command horn, but. Yeah, I could tell, and that it's like that time. Whatever was going on, we we'll learn from the story. What if you know these people are in desperation mode and they're doing whatever they can 
you know, just like we see an 08 MS team and the rider is a fan of 08 MS team. So there you go. Yeah. Well, speaking of writers who are fans, let's go oh. ahead and hop into our topic in chief today because we are going to be going over some uh, fans of Tamino's work as well as Tamino's hot takes himself. So as I said, you know, there was this thread on Twitter um, at Fufuro Moe, if you're not familiar with them. They covered all of the translated comments that Yoshiki Tomino made at the film festival last week. He was being interviewed by, um, oh, what's the name? One of the mecha designers on Char's Counterattack. So obviously they had a lot to talk about when it comes to Char's Counterattack. Okay. Um, now... It looks like this was one of the first comments that came up. You know, Tomino's unique editing style was also a big subject. Tomino complained about the people that say his sense of editing is weird or bad, <laughs> to which he said, how can they say that about me when there's guys like Hideki Anno, who is, you know, infam infamously the creator of um, Evangelion, which I'm personally not a huge fan of. Adam, how do you feel about Eva? I, I probably need to give it a fair shake. I did s start watching it and then I got bored. <laughs> um, but that's I have to be in the right mindset. Although I'm wondering what you think. Like <clears throat> I've seen some things from Hideaki Anno, um, which I think Gunbuster would has some scenes or edits or whatever you call it that would be questionable. Something we were talking about earlier, depending on your culture, uh, you know, because there's you know in Gunbuster uh, had uh, you know the younger looking women and then would have them you know in their underwear or whatever but i <laughs> right i wonder then if they're referring to the thing that you've pointed out to me about tomino's style of the kind of show don't tell like do you think that's what they're referring to because you could be like okay why is that shot there and then you've been able to do a good jo job dissecting that he's actually intentionally trying to show the audience something maybe most people don't understand yeah, you know, I think that there's definitely some culture shock, some some cultural differences. I think that, um, you know, here in America, we come from a pretty Puritan background. And so it's yeah. when we see those kinds of open expressions of, um, I don't even want to say sexuality, because I don't think that it's, it's not. really rooted in sexuality. Exactly. It's, it's, I think it's, we, I think the American culture is trying to almost paint things as, oh, that's a sexual thing. So that's not good. Right. And, and I've kind um, of been brainwashed by that. True. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, Izubuchi and and thank you to uh, Alter slash no one uh, for calling oh. out Izubuchi as the it was one of the um, speakers. So Izubuchi and Ano commented about, you know, Tomino. Th this was in a previous interview like years ago, one that we're going to be referencing some quotes from, but it's not one of the quotes we're going to be talking about. But they described uh, Yasuhiko's artwork as erotic and like the line work that he used on characters was very sexually charged and had this energy to it. And, um, you know, I think it's like par partially where like that waifu culture comes from, you know? Yeah, I guess it's just accentuating, you know, a lot of times when you're drawing, because I'm someone that I like to draw, I used to do it a lot more, but there's certain details that you are almost exaggerating and and it could be that that's just more of to give form and shape to something but someone could take it the wrong way yeah for sure um, and um you know that's where like caricature design comes from yeah. like you know the idea that you're gonna highlight someone's nose because you want to accentuate like how you stress how big their nose is or something like that or, or like their teeth whatever the it, case may be yeah and in anime that's kind of a thing that i think is a standard with eyes i think yes even if they're not huge, like we see in C, even if they're smaller, there's still the eyes have this kind of unique sort of through line throughout all anime where I think that's even, and I could be wrong about this take, but I feel like that has sort of informed the way Disney has been drawing their characters. I'm glad you mentioned that because last week I know that Vampy mentioned that she, she had a problem with like the seed style eyes, like the oversized yeah. eyes. Yeah. And what's interesting to me is I actually have a Disney princess coloring book that my little daughter, you know, she never colors inside the lines, obviously. But, you know, I was comparing because it's got like some of the older Disney princesses like Sleeping Beauty and Snow White next to some of the newer ones like Rapunzel and Elsa and Anna and stuff like that. And I was like, the facial features are so radically different. Yeah. 
it, it's interesting how it seems like, and this is even with video games, I think Blizzard kicked this off, where there's been this sort of uh, characterization of characters, maybe as technology allows more detail, it is harder to then consistently have more detail. So there's more of, okay, how can we then make something look interesting because we can't really put all the detail into it. Kind of like how they did, you know, the Batman animated series cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. With that, that Bruce Tim art style, that's got the like sharp features. Yeah. yeah I think that once the uh, Gundam metaverse hits, we're all just going to be looking like Fortnite characters. So. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, oh, and I suppose I should add this disclaimer before we get too far into the weeds here is like, for the purposes of this discussion, we're just going to be taking Tomino at his word because we know that he can be kind of a troll sometimes, hence the question of the day. You yeah. know, does he necessarily always mean what he says? Maybe, probably not. We'll see. Uh, but for the purposes of this, I think it's going to make for a much more interesting discussion if we, you know, take him at his word. Yeah. So what's interesting to me about criti criticizing uh, Hidaki Anno is... In the Shars Counterattack Book Club, which was translated by uh, Kodazat, at Kodazat on Twitter, um, there was this interview between Ano and Tomino in which Ano basically fanboys over Shars Counterattack. And Tomino was like, oh, you know, thank you. <laughs> Ano was, of course, part of the staff, did some of the mech designs for them. And yeah, you know, it turns out a lot of industry people enjoyed Shars Counterattack. We made this book because we wanted to gather their opinions in one place. Tomino says, I believe that you're being sincere. I know that you're not just flattering me, but really, I hadn't heard that at all, that it was so well liked. So it's very interesting to me that Tomino would sit here and say like, oh, how can you say that there's someone as terrible as me when there's Ano? And it's like, well, you kind of created Ano because, you know, he's yeah. looking up to your works. And, and so obviously they're talking about Char's counterattack here. And it's like, so you're going to say that the editing and the pacing in Char's counterattack was weird and bad. But we'll, we'll look at Anno. Well, Anno worked on Shark's Counterattack. So it's, you know, it's kind of a funny um, through line to where yeah. Anno's directorial style came from. Um, yeah, that as is. As a result of his fanboying. That's interesting because didn't he go on to now do uh, live action? Is, isn't he the one that did Shin Godzilla and all those Shin things? Or am I thinking of another? Uh, I don't know. I'm not I'm not huge oh. into the uh, kaiju movies, so I, I no. would have to defer to chat on that because I know that Ultronimus is um, if Pyro's in the chat, then he would probably know as well. Yeah, but... it is him. Yeah, he directed it. So that's what's pretty cool is I had known of him just for the anime that he's well known for that I never watched. And then I watched Shin Godzilla and I was like, this is a fantastic Godzilla movie. I probably still like it more than Godzilla Minus One, even though I think Godzilla Minus One is a better movie. I just like what Shin Godzilla was trying to do. Uh, you know? Interesting. Yeah, because Shin Godzilla is more about like, okay, here's how the bureaucracy would work. And then here's, a, let's look at some show-don't-tell evolution of Godzilla and his reproduction. <laughs> and then Godzilla Minus One is just like, here's just a really good story of people caught up in godzilla but so perhaps i judged ano too too harshly well, well so that's another thing in uh, again this is tomino i think comes from a more um and i don't know how to explain what i'm trying to say when i watched the original mobile suit gun and one of the things that stood out to me was how much it is shot like a movie and yes. more than <clears throat> other anime that i've watched and so to see that you know ano is working with tomino and then Anna went on his own, and now he's making live action movies. To me, that goes to what you're saying, that through line. Yeah. So. And I think that that was always something that Tomino was interested in doing was live action. But, um, and, and I may be misremembering the quote, but, you know, prior to working on Mobile Suit Gundam, you know, he was kind of burnt out on working on anime. But mm. I don't know. Maybe he found something there that reinvigorated his passions. Yeah. So let's take a look at some of the other comments here. <clears throat> so here we go. As usual, Tomino didn't mince words. He first praised Izubuchi, who can draw anything and change styles, unlike Nagano or Kunio Okawara. It seems like there are a lot of similar people in the industry. So this is interesting that he's, you know, criticizing some of the earlier designers. Uh, Okawara, of course, working on 0079. Nagano famously designed the Zeta Gundam. Um so interesting that, you know, he 
was heaping this praise on Izubuchi. I don't know if I necessarily have a direct quote from Tomino previously that addresses his feelings towards Nagano or Okawara. Uh, yeah. Are you familiar with anything like that? No, 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 no. And if I was to dissect this, I would, you know, I would see it as like, you know, it's, um, wait, did you say Izubuchi did Shark's Counterattack? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd almost say that like it, once it got to the point that Tomino had the, the complete free reign, like he was probably able to get more out of his, what his intention is with artists. Whereas like, you know, kind of restricted in the original mobile suit Gundam, they go to hire uh, uh, an engineer to a mechanical engineer to do designs, which while there's a limit to that, there's also like something new to that. So I can see where maybe Kunio is limited because he's doing it within a framework of mechanical engineering. That's know. true. Yeah. And I think uh, Izubuchi also comes from a background of like character design as well. So, um, uh, yeah. you know, his ability to to draw characters as well as Mecha is yeah, that makes him much more diverse and diverse. Um, organics it, for me it's very hard when i'm drawing to do organic things well real organic things if i'm making up an alien right <laughs> all bets are off yeah <laughs> but um like yeah being able to because it's really hard doing real people that look real because it's very easy one little thing that's off can kind of throw you off and be like what am i looking at but then the mechanical as well because there has to be even lines there has to be some Symmetry. sort of yeah, because then people could look at it and be like, okay, what am I looking at? And it might look like one of those, you know, classic Gundam cells of from the original. <laughs> There's like stretched face. Exactly. Yeah. And nobody likes those. <laughs> <laughs> or do we? I mean, I appreciate them for yeah. what they are. <laughs> So this is when the conversation finally moved to Char's counterattack. For Izubuchi, Char is a psychopath. He lies all the time from Zeta to Char's counterattack, and even his final line in Char's counterattack might be a lie, to which Tomino was in complete agreement. So this might be one of those like troll huh. comments. I think someone on Twitter pointed out, like, I think as he gets older, Tomino just agrees with whatever anybody says about his previous works. But... If he is trying to say that, yeah, Shark, uh, Shark, Shar is a complete psychopath, I would say, well, that explains Zeta and Shar's counterattack. <laughs> <laughs> and and right. I think that's a thing, too, where if you have someone that has this power that they're able to use and manipulate, that can kind of give them a confidence to go about things however they want. And so maybe their lies are even lies to themselves. Uh, you know, that's true. I mean, one of the things I think I, I, try to remind people of sometimes because you know they'll say like well this character said this in this anime so it must be true it's like well they could have been lying or they could have been misinformed you know you have like the unreliable narrator yeah but um let's see what uh tomino has said about char in the past in previous interviews and see if it kind of lines up with <laughs> with char being a psychopath so this is from an an america interview uh from Xeonic Scans, so it's on the Xeonic Scan, uh, you know, Xeonic Republic website, but it was conducted by Mark Simmons, ah, our, our yeah. favorite uh, translator. interviewer slash yeah. translator. Um, now, I don't want to, like, obviously read through all of this, but, you know, your, your newest Gundam work specifically uh, introduced in the U.S., Char's Counterattack. Obviously, new types have a meaning for Char. What does Char interpret new types as? Tomino says what he was going after is this concept of the next step or being something greater than himself in a Nietzschean term that I can't help but translate as Superman. So it's, he actually means like the Ubermensch, uh, you know, the mm. Overman, like the, you know, higher evolved form of mankind. So Tomino go, goes on to say, you know, even if you're in the position to become this absolute being, a single person can't attain it. And if he does, it's meaningless unless a greater community, 100 people, 1,000 people, attain it with you so the motivation of char is even if he himself had become a new type it doesn't hold the same value unless all of humanity can become new types is what he's saying here yeah doesn't I, quite sound psychopathic to me well maybe it is no i kind of like i kind of like what you're getting at unless it is that char is He's a psychopath, but smart enough to know he has to manipulate to do that. And so manipulating mm -hmm. is getting people around this concept of space noid versus 
earthy and i think i used the wrong uh pronouns but um because the, the other thing about this if you look at a character like amuro or just in general how humans would be if i knew i had a superpower i would personally start feeling like i'm better and i don't know if that would get to my head but if you look at a character like amuro he, he doesn't seem like the type to where he takes that he's a new type to some level if he has a duty he will go to that duty but remember when he's on house arrest he's like all right I'll, i mean it's like it's not like no i'm this superhero i have to whereas char on the other hand it's like no matter what ah, i'm 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 a new type i should be able to do all of this maybe right. i have to round up other people you know that, i think in the movie amuro himself says char what gives you the right to look down on other people and it's like that, well yeah that they, that, there we go yeah. um and then i'm glad that he mentioned in the last line that he was probably even lying in the last line because in that same interview mark simmons asks my editor is dying to know what are the meaning of char's last words to amuro tomino says that women can't understand that line how did it go again which i think is hilarious that tomino doesn't even like remember some of the lines that made it into the film um and so as you guys infamously know lala could have been a mother to me amuro's like huh and then they erupt into flames as axis um is is pushed away so well, tomino calls this a very nuanced thing the power of a boy child sort of nuzzling up to his mother and wanting to be doted upon the boy child's feeling of wanting to be enveloped by the mothering instinct without condition unconditional love i you know what? I could see that. That even speaks more to the psychopathic nature because it's the idea of having mother issues, what happened to his family at a young age. And then he's trying to fight back, not giving himself time to, and, and even the relationship he, so as a psychopath, the relationships he have, he has with women it tend to not be toxic or negative. You know what I mean? Even if they turn out that way because they are drawn to him and then he gets them into battle. But more of like Nanai, like seeing how there is that sort of motherly thing, because I think that's what he wants in a lot of maybe men, boys like that. So that's maybe what Tomino is doing with that writing is like with you like to be able to have that feeling. And I guess at the end of the day, like Char's final words and how he, you know, he talks about Lala all the time. And it might not be that he's in love with her romantically, but he loves her because he started getting those feelings back that maybe he yeah. missed from his mother and that is so it's like you know how you know people will make fun of girls oh daddy issues i mean this is sharp mommy yeah issues. like classic oedipal uh relationship i think i mean we would describe norman bates from oh yeah uh, he would be a psychopath and of course obviously a dysfunctional relationship like with his mother so yeah i think that there's there's something to be hmm. said here about that but we have some more things that we can uh, explore here okay so uh, this is from a previous interview, again, um, translated by Mark Simmons from the Shars Counterattack Encyclopedia. And he describes the hardest part about writing sh characters like Shar and Amuro is that they've gotten older. When he first made it, made Gundam, he wrote it, a story about them growing up. And he goes on to say that while Shar and Amuro have gotten older, they haven't become what you'd call adults. They are the ones who challenge the adults. And so it seems strange to call them children, but that's what they are. So what would happen if people who are children acted like they wanted to with, the, with you know, no inhibition? That is the story of Shar's counterattack. I guess that makes sense. Shar never really got to live out a childhood. He kind of got thrust into the survival mode. Yeah. And and same he, with Amuro. I mean, yeah, same with Amuro. And so they I, I think never... that even even prior to the events of Mobile Suit Gundam, you know, the idea that he was constantly traveling around with Tem Ray and that they were separated from his mother, I, I think that Amuro might be suffering the same sort of disconnect and the same sort of longing for a mother figure that uh, that Shar is, albeit to a lesser, maybe healthier extent. Yeah, and I would even say, yeah, not to diminish what Amuro has gone through, but it's like his dad is excited for Amuro, but it, for different reasons. You know what I mean? It's right. It's more about his work. His mom, it's like it, Amuro can still get closure with his mom, knowing his mom's just so anti-war, anti-space, you know, like it's like, well, sure. mom, come on, you're on Facebook too much, you know, that, <laughs> that type of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. 
is interesting. So again, another interesting insight. I think I have one more. Uh, oh, no, that was that was it. But I think that this is going to bring us into another interesting topic because you mentioned Nanai mm-hmm. and Nanai was a topic of conversation at the uh, at the film festival as well. So another great interpretation from Izabuchi was about Nanai's character, that she was the only good woman in the film, in parentheses, Chan is the worst. Uh, and Tomino's answer was absolutely right. Um, now, all memeing aside, I know that uh, everyone's probably familiar with some of the uh, raunchier things that Tamino has said about Nanai's character in the past, but we're going to look specifically at some previous quotes that he's brought up, you know, specifically in reference to like women and the women in Shar's counterattack. So going back to the Shar's counterattack book club interview with, uh, conducted by Ano, so uh, they say that it is mostly women who do the betraying in Tomino shows. Tomino says, really? <laughs> like, yeah, really. <laughs> it's like Rekua and Sarah and uh, even Emma. You know, you could consider Emma's defection yep. to the AU a, a betrayal. Yep. Um, and so what's interesting is Tomino says, you can't call that betrayal when a woman does it. Women are quick to change their stance on things. So to a man, it looks like betrayal, but only from his point of view. They think that, or he says, he goes on to say, they give up on their men. Why do they abandon them? It's sort of a basic self instinct, I think. Women can't survive without depending on someone. That's an epist- epistemology that men came up with. Women are quick to change sides once they think, I can't live like this. This doesn't feel good to me, or you're not the ideal sex partner for me. So, what's interesting to me about this is that from this perspective, Chan and Nanai are the same. Because they're both fiercely loyal to the men yeah. in Shar's counterattack. In fact, the only woman in Shar's counterattack that expresses this type of disloyalty would be Quess. Yeah, and it's interesting to think that in in this situation, Chan and Anai are not only in a relationship with Amaron Shar, but with their lack of a better word, their work, like their point of their life, like initiatives that they need to complete in life are aligned it's this defending or the offensive of you know space versus earth like i i find that part um interesting because you know there is something to that and i guess society and culture through times might dictate how men are viewing women women at any time you know like there is a thing where like you know usually the men were the ones that worked and so the women didn't but then you know there's a lot of women that really do feel like you know it's important that i work just like a man because i can't just depend on a man and i think that makes sense i think maybe there was a time where that existed and maybe in japanese culture it was like that for a while and then those ideas are kind of translated to paper whereas i think in the future like in this universal century future and we do see this. We see women in all different types of roles. And I don't Very think true. they would be as th- they are portrayed in modern times where there's still this, I think, blurred line between when it was just women were at home and not paid as much. And now they're doing any job anyone can do and getting paid equal. I would think that would be more reflective in the future. But maybe at the time Tomino was writing, you see, that just seemed like how things were. Well, and I think that there's something to be said about like biology not keeping up with culture, right? Like Ooh. our ideas about what gender roles might be have changed, but like our biology hasn't caught up to that yet. And, yeah. you know, you see this, I think, even with issues like fertility, you know, the fact that like, um, you know, men and women are waiting until much later in life to start having children, at least, you know, in what we would consider like first world countries. Oh, yeah. And so it's like, even though the uh the average lifespan is longer than it was our bodies have not kind of evolved to catch up with the cultural changes that we've made over time and so you know i I think that maybe that's something of what tomino is getting at here where it's like yeah you know maybe there's this inbuilt like biological component that's going on that in spite of everything that you see exterior you know there's there's definitely some interior um conflict going on good point i need to remember that whole thing about yeah the biology not necessarily keeping up with the culture i find that interesting i think that's what's going on today in general 100 yeah, yeah. yeah um 
And I think this goes back to what you were saying about Char, um, which I think, I don't know. I mean, I think that based on what we were reading, the jury's still out on whether Char is a psychopath, but we definitely have identified the uh, mommy issues there. And so uh, Tomino says that sometimes men want to cling to women. I thought that Nanai is probably the kind of woman that Char would like to cling to more than anything. He created Nanai as a character that Char wouldn't look silly holding on to. And so when thinking about, you know, what kind of woman that is, he gets in touch with his inner masturbatory rhythm and he asks himself what type of woman would, <laughs> <laughs> would uh, make Char feel good. <laughs> I'm going to try and keep things, uh, I don't know, PG-13, I guess. <laughs> but obviously, like I said, you know, Tomino is famous for having some um, interesting takes. So again, you know, we get this idealization of Nanai, not only from the fans of Char's Counterattack, Ano and Izubuchi, who, you know, again, they worked on it, but they were also kind of super fans prior to, um, you know, prior to working on Gundam and Tomino is kind of confirming that right yeah I that those last few sentences are hilarious and <laughs> it's hilarious in the way of what we were speaking on before where Tomino is saying things very um uh what is a good word for that where he's just saying it how it is in a way where there's exactly yeah, especially when there's a lot of these things that are ta taboo to speak of in that nature. Usually there would be other ways to say that. But I think it's cool that he's kind of getting to the point of it because, you know, I mean, I think that's a thing that exists. You know, I, even as a young man, I felt like sometimes I spent too much worrying about dating than really myself, you know, and, or, and even, you know, my wife, when we first met, my, she would call me gummy gummy beer because i was always like you know holding on to her cuddling with her and Aww. so there is that sort of like thing that exists that a lot of times aren't talked about because if 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 a man comes off all clingy and romantic like that almost doesn't look as heroic and cool so it's yep. almost like uh tomino is able to write char to be that way while not appearing that way if that makes sense it doesn't use lose the masculinity that that I think is kind of a fake thing that people always judge by. Like, oh, that's he's not a man, you know, that type of thing. So right. yeah, this is almost kind of opening things up more, looking at how Tomino is writing Char. It's like he's able to show Char's vulnerability, but he hides it with the relationships he has with the women they write. I think so. I think that, you know, by by creating these types of, you know, whether they are sexually idealized or maybe they're idealized as like a type of female role that we associate with, like being a mother or nurturing or something like that. You know, he creates these objects of affection that Char can cling on to. And it's very interesting because if you look at the dialogue in Char's counterattack, look at how many times Char tells women in particular that he needs them or that he's relying on them yeah you know right it, and he does it, it always comes off kind of, of awkward he's it's like, like it's like in context of the greater thing that's going on but really is it more for himself and he's using what's going on because he had to do that his whole life after his parents you know yeah yeah so interesting interesting stuff and again it's like you know if you can get past the kind of um i don't want to say vulgarity but like the the uh bluntness the, yeah the blunt sort the of, sheer honesty of tomino's yeah. words you can start to kind of unpack some of these things that are going on beneath the surface and, and i'll just add one more thing that i think like i almost feel like it's not that he's being so like deep it's he's actually willing to talk about things that people just don't talk about but are part of our lives at all times I think that that's something that you, that, you know, we've kind of touched on this before, like the idea that podcasts and long form media consumption has gone up so much, like the idea that people can sit and watch like a three, four hour podcast, but they can't watch a 30 minute TV show. And it's because that level of artifice has been removed and you have uh, people yeah. having hard conversations without this kind of set dressing to make it seem like it's okay to talk about these things. It's like, these are... I think that they're basic and fundamental things that we 
that we talk about and we interact with as human beings, but like, we're just, I don't know, we're just bottled up. Like maybe we don't want to offend people or right. we don't want to exclude anyone or not come but, off, not masculine, you know? <laughs> right. Like, Oh, I gotta be a macho man. Like, you know? Yeah. Mas- <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. So yeah, I think that, Oh, here we go. So uh, these are, these are perfect ways of describing it. Unfiltered, uh, authentic, yeah. uh, uncouthness. <laughs> That's <laughs> very well said. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that it's very important to take the context of when a creator is speaking about something, you know, in, into account when you're thinking about how they're talking about their work. Because I think that a lot of people t- tend to look at what Tomino said in the past 15, 20 years about, you know, anime that he created 45, 30 years ago that, you know, maybe his perspectives have changed. Maybe he's misremembering things. Like I said, you know, he can't even remember some of the lines from <laughs> these well, things. Yeah. So that it brings up another point. So it's like, yeah, maybe he can't remember a line, but maybe he understands what he's trying to do. And it's more when people are like uh, dissecting, oh, look at what Tomina wrote. And he's like, no, this is just how things are. Yeah. 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 And you don't really realize that because like you were comparing podcasts with a 30 minute show, a 30 minute show is being written with intention, whereas a podcast who knows what that who knows if someone's confronted with something that might make them react in a way that people didn't expect. Whereas no, in the show, things are going to be written as you expect them to play out. Yeah. And, and I know I'm going to bring this up again and you're going to, you're going to tease me for it because like the, the show that I always go to as like the most writery show, that's like so scripted to the point where it's unrealistic is Gilmore girls. Oh, I haven't watched <laughs> it, but okay. It's just a, uh, you know, like a safe, comfy yeah you know it's safe comfy i think you know obviously there's some there's some cute relationship drama that goes on in the show but like the dialogue in particular you know and this is i think a critique that you and i've talked about like when it comes to like marvel movies and stuff is it's so removed from the situation like you know Mm. it's almost like these characters know that they're in a story that doesn't have high stakes because as soon as they say, say cut like everything goes back to being normal and so yeah. when you have those types of interactions that it, it, and like we've kind of talked about this before how tomino writes humans as they are not necessarily how right. we want them to be and so it's like we always think that when we're in an argument with someone we're going to have like that perfect one liner that just cuts them to their core when really we think of it like three weeks later and right it's like, oh, and man, or we don't say this. the thing right there that we exactly. should exactly you know this is a really good point because it, it, again it goes back to uh, the last Jedi when Poe Dameron's in front of that giant star destroyer and he's making a mom joke. It's like, okay, yeah. in that situation, the characters would have to realize, Oh, Poe's in a dangerous situation in front of this star destroyer. It's going to kill him. So they make this joke to kind of almost like play on that situation. It goes to what you were saying where the dialogue is written in a way where everyone's in on what's happening. Yeah. When, then that takes you out yeah yeah that's pretty good um but yeah so those were some of the uh kind of standout comments that that tomino made about char's counterattack and i think that you know after unpacking some of the things that he said over the years maybe some of it holds up maybe some of it doesn't i definitely think that there's some trolling going on uh, there and you know honestly he's probably just tired of talking about it (laughs) Yeah, I wonder. I w- it would be neat one day to meet and have a talk with him. The problem is, I think at any time that uh, translation occurs, you you are probably losing some layers of nuance that answers your question. You know, even For in sure. these translations, it's probably the same way. You know. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely some of you know what we would consider blunt language. I wonder how common those yeah. discussions are had in Japanese. That it's like don't even think about it yeah good point now other hot takes that tomino's had and i probably gave a little bit of this away but uh i figured this would be something that adam and i would enjoy talking about is uh tomino doesn't like video games <laughs> <laughs> um i think that this this came up this was obviously um on Xeonic scans as well oh there we go um this was on Xeonic scans as well they were considering making a turn a gundam video game and 
Uh, Tomino says, to put it bluntly, turning turn A into a video game is impossible if you only think about current games. The theory of games is conceived by game developers is just too narrow. With such sheer volume, many games are essentially the same, differing only in name. From this perspective, creating a game from turn A would be a tall order. But this is from the current crop of computer games, truly to the extent of what is possible. So this is something that like I would probably take issue with is that Tomino suggesting that like there's really not that many types of genres of video game. I, I like I, I, it's interesting what he's saying, and I could see if from a point of view of someone that is almost 80, is that yeah. correct? Almost 80. What if his only experience with then video games were when like he heard a Gundam game was coming out in the 80s and he played? It's like, well, this isn't doing what my creative output is, is usually bringing new ideas and challenging people. But and, and I bet it's just he doesn't realize the potential. Now, he does bring up how making games uh, is not simple, which that's true. So I think he can yeah. from there and from what he's seen be like, yeah, we because part of what. Tomino delivers in his works that video games also do is deliver an experience in a world, right? And I think more and more we can do that with video games, but that has to be the intention of the video game, not, oh, let's make an, this property a game. That's why he's saying right. it's the same games, just different names. So I think what he's seeing, and this is actually a good example of that, is on the surface for video gaming, that's what it looks like. Yeah. Even though there's more potential than that. And I think we've had that conversation before where it's like almost every Gundam video game is just a reskinned game with Gundam, you know, set dressing. Exactly. Um, it's interesting, though. I think that he does go on to talk about a video game that his wife and uh, he play called Puzzle Bobble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> though we've grown bored of it. It's just perfect for a 30 minute playthrough. As for IQ, we lost interest in playing after three months. When we bought it, we thought this might be a game changer, but it had a major flaw, um, which is interesting. He said that the game lacks replayability because it was too difficult for him. Well, you know what? It is interesting. It's something that I've been thinking about lately is how video games, and it made sense before, but it doesn't necessarily now make sense, is video games are all under one thing. Like, I see it as, like, interactive entertainment, but something like Puzzle Bobble, I wouldn't put in the same categories like Spider-Man 2 on PlayStation. Like, right. So again, that's I think that's just the lack of understanding and knowing and saying, oh, a video game is just this thing you manipulate with a controller. But it's I see it today as it's inter and, and that's and I bring this up because I think that's the issue with publishers and developers nowadays is a lot of times they're the 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 market they're targeting is it, it's really a subset yet they're going after a big market that wouldn't care and exactly. that's where we get all these layoffs and stuff and i think that there's like some categorization errors because obviously they're you know we've started to consider cell phone gamers like mobile gamers oh. like gamers right and it's not quite the same there's not a one-to-one -one translation and so you can't target all the members of this medium when you know a, a large portion of them are never going to interact with any of the console or PC stuff. So it's like, exactly, you know, I, I think that uh, there, there's the saying and it, it drives me nuts because it's mispronounced, but like the riches are in the niches. And it's like by, by getting down into your niche and you can define like your real target demographic, then you can find some, some really interested fans that want to play your game. But by trying to go for the mass appeal, you end up kind of, kneecapping yourself yeah and so yeah i think that you know maybe tomino's uh comments on video games come from a place of uh, you know they come from a place of ignorance but not necessarily th there's an observation there that i yep. think is true but um i think that you know had he been had he been working in video games say as long as like hideo kojima he might have a different right. perspective that's on a really narrative cool. in video games I would love them two to talk. There's yeah. got to be some interview somewhere. If not, uh, Kojima has a podcast, so that needs to get set up somehow. That would be fantastic because, oh, wow. you know, I know that people's opinions of Kojima are mixed, uh, yeah. to say the very least. But, like, I have always kind of respected the work that he does. And, yeah. you know, uh, I you don't know, think while... I've ever beaten a game of his, but <laughs> I, everything he does is awesome. It is. Yeah. I, I mean, 
I, I think that you brought up the fact that like Helldivers is basically Metal Gear Solid Five gameplay, but yeah. with the added you know element of being co op and you know the different the, types of yeah the interactive world and yeah. enemies and things like that. Yeah, very so, interesting. Very cool. Which again makes me feel like I really need to go back then and beat or play through Metal Gear Solid Five. I played Ground Zeroes. I didn't play yeah Phantom Pain. I think was yeah. if if the Hell Divers devs, which is such a successful game right now, they you know took after Metal Gear Solid Five on purpose. That's I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I think that uh, I've said in the past that like the Metal Gear Solid games are successful in spite of Kojima's storytelling, not because of it. Uh, <laughs> um, I, yeah, yeah, but it, uh, it's revel- it's like he's able to come up with good gameplay ideas. And then he does his wacky storytelling on top of it, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, and of course, I think that th- this is an interesting analysis is I bet that Tomino and Kojima would not be friends if only because of this is because in Metal Gear Solid 5, there's that character quiet who, you know, skimpy sniper wears a bikini mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, goes out sniping and has superpowers and all this stuff. And Kojima came up with this whole elaborate explanation as to like no no you don't understand she has to be naked because there's like a biological component and like you know it's it's important for the story that she be naked i think that tomino would probably just be like yeah she's naked because there's a biological component that gets me going (laughs) and and then he gestures to his crotch like (laughs) in the auto interview Um, that's yeah there's like it's funny because would you agree that Kojima is really not fully saying the truth. It's that yeah. thing we were talking about. There's certain things people just don't say because of the way right. people take it. Yeah. I think that Kojima doesn't want to come off as a creep. You know, he doesn't right. want the to perfect say, thing like, we were talking about earlier. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I think that that would be a point of contention between them. But you know, two visionary guys. I would love to hear them kind of uh, go back and forth at each other. <laughs> Yeah, on storytelling specifically, I'd love to hear them talk about that because I think the core of what they're both really, uh, their creative nature is how they are telling stories. So Right. And yeah. they both have a propensity to tell war stories um, mm-hmm. just in different mediums. Yeah. Now, before we sign off for the day, I think I do want to uh, share some thoughts. And I'm interested to hear what you think about this because, okay. um, you know, we brought up the idea of, of, of hell divers. And of course, that has got people talking on Twitter like crazy about the idea of satire. Oh, yeah. And I got to tell you, I'm tired of satire. I'm tired of hearing the word satire. I'm tired of satire as a rhetorical device. And I. Ultimately, I think it's just like wildly ineffective at conveying an idea because it's only ever capable of reacting and criticizing something without offering a viable alternative to it. Yeah, I think it really depends on what is that point of that storytelling. Like when I see Hell Dot, or I was telling you, Starship Troopers, original movie, it's like, let's make this sci fi movie. There's aliens just fighting in it. You know, I'm sure that's what the studio is thinking. They have the director look at it and he's all like okay to make the story really make sense i'm gonna have to make fun of it right you know and and i think that's kind of what hell divers is doing because it, it they're going across all these planets just killing murdering so <laughs> they have to like add this little tinge of the satire um what are some examples you don't like so i guess um you know you you brought up starship troopers and hell divers which i think are good examples of like you know, it, it's almost like retroactive claims to satire. It's like, hey guys, remember, you're not supposed to like killing oh, the bugs. Yeah. You know, that is interesting. Um, it, it, it's very much, um, and it goes in line with what we were saying about Tamino. Is it's like there's this level of dishonesty about it because it's like, hey, we know that you enjoy the gameplay of going around shooting bugs, but like you're you're not supposed to like it. Like we're making fun of you for for enjoying shooting the bugs and it's like well then why did you make the game in the first place <laughs> okay so this is interesting because i feel like when robert heinlein first wrote starship troopers i don't think he's trying to like spread some gospel it's so, like here's a story yeah you might not agree with what's going on like if it happened in real life but that's not the point of it the point of it's just experience the story so by the time it was to be told in a movie i bet um oh the director why Bro- am i forgetting 
Yeah, Verhoeven. Paul Verhoeven was probably like, well, if we're going to make this story interesting because we're fighting giant aliens, I'm going to have to have a little bit of satire on what's going on. And then I bet, I think what's happening with Helldivers is more of kids that grew up watching Starship Troopers just want to make that as, you know, again, I doubt it's politically charged. I doubt it's, but then it makes me think, doesn't Robocop even have uh, satire in it as well? Wow, I'm glad that you mentioned okay. that because uh, no one just dropped in the chat uh, Robocop and Total Recall. Yeah, um, yeah, the same director. Yeah, I, I, and you know what? That's that Paul Verhoeven and his dang satire. Well, here's the thing, because I think it's it just, and he even does that with Showgirls. Yeah. Because I, I haven't watched Showgirls. I've watched things about it and how he purposely makes the sex stuff way bigger than it would be in real life because it's like, well, we're telling the story. Might as well. So it's almost like he's almost like the type of director that when you're given some, and it, yeah, it reminds me of when I watch a movie that's serious and I'm, and it's like, well, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, what are they really trying to do here? And, um, yeah, just just thinking of uh, satire is sometimes used more of. Uh, it's almost like planting it, it, like if there if i know i'm talking like crazy here. if there no, no, wasn't no. satire in a situation maybe what's trying to be portrayed couldn't be portrayed if that okay. makes sense yeah that's an interesting way of looking yeah. at it because... and so maybe yeah as paul verhoeven's looking at these scripts he's like well okay i can have a movie about this but that's not as interesting as if i was to make it crazier than it's supposed to be or almost like it's normal yeah because you know? like the the whole um idea of robocop i think was like it was about it was supposed to be like a, a straight straight laced like cyborg cop movie and it's like are, are you serious you you want to make a movie about a cyborg cop like let me kind of layer in some well yeah because uh, if th if they were to sit there and think okay how can we realistically make a cyborg cop movie i guess a corporation that has the money to develop it would be the but then they would want to make sure they're making money so then there's going to be some crap yeah there's like a thought process okay that reminds me i you know i love the gremlins movies especially the second oh, yeah. movie because the, yes, the second gremlins one. movie is taking the first one and making it crazy right and i thought if they made another gremlins movie which they actually have a cgi show on tv by the way i didn't know that <laughs> yes i think it's called mogwai or something or gizmo mogwai i don't know but they it, i was like well if they made a third um Gre gremlins movie i'd want it to kind of be like what happened during covid oh take yeah. those elements of how society worked together what governing bodies were trying to do while the covid gremlins were still running around causing havoc everywhere you know, and then there's some people that were for it and some people that were against it. So it's almost like, you know what I mean? I feel like that that's yeah. like a satire that I think is it's not giving an alternative, but it's almost like pointing out the ridiculousness that we lived through. That's a good way of putting it. And yeah. I think, you know, one of the examples I brought up, uh, you know, prior to the show starting is like, you know, because I know that the idea of like RoboCop and, and Helldivers, those can be kind of... Um, highly disputed and like controversial versions of satire but like one version of satire that i think we all agree on is like idiocracy oh where like that's a movie like all of us laugh at because we can all see the ridiculousness of like basically appealing to the lowest common denominator and what the end result of that is right and so but but again i think that it fails to provide what i would consider like a viable alternative to what we have right and so like we can we can criticize the existence of of democracy and as it is but you know is the solution that we have just one guy that's like the philosopher king that tells us that we need to water our plants with water instead of gatorade like you know is that really what we're suggesting or is there something is it maybe just supposed to be like a warning story yeah I, yeah that's because you know what that that movie kind of stays with people as they talk about it. And it's basically when things happen in reality, we're like, well, there we go. Idiocracy. You know, it's, it's almost yeah. like an active participant. It, it's interesting how those things become like, they become referential in a way. Like we, we tend to like, okay, we appreciate the satire. We laugh at it. And then years later, when it actually comes to pass, we kind of like go back and reference it. Like, 
Simpsons. Oh, hey, remember when RoboCop 2 said that Detroit would be bankrupt and then like then yeah. they went bankrupt in the in the 2010s? It's like are we supposed to be proud of that? Yeah. I, I yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's interesting. It's we'll recognize things and be like, "Huh, the comedy and the fact that art and reality uh uh coexist, but yeah, what is the action?" Right. Yeah, that's so, yeah, I mean, it's just it, it's interesting that there's no sort of uh, call to action when it comes to satire. And you compare that with like something like what Tomino does, which obviously, you know, I, I yeah. don't know if necessarily he provides a clear distinction about, you know, what human beings need to do to resolve these sort of intergenerational conflicts that we always get ourselves into. But the idea of new type theory sort of informs that right this idea of compassion and understanding that you don't see and i think that maybe maybe one of the reasons that people don't like the new type stuff like you know that seems to be common among gundam fans they're like oh i can't get into like the sappy new type stuff yeah. like give me eight ms team or 0083 right. um i think that part of it is like we fail to kind of understand the point of it is you know <laughs> to, at the risk of sounding cheesy it's like oh the new types in all of us like we we can choose to be new types the same way that like you know you can choose to be a jedi if you just throw your lightsaber down instead of striking down your father yeah kind of thing. um yeah yeah I, I i like that you brought this up because the way tomino is writing it, it's like he could write satire against colony drops against a space race you know but instead it's more like writing how people act in real life that's really not written for screen so we're taking this crazy situation tomino writes things in a way that's not usually written on screen and it makes it work yeah i think so um jam calix has the best the best advice for us all is don't be weighed down by gravity yeah <laughs> but uh yeah i think that that's th that I, I would call tomino the anti-satirist yeah because yeah. he's just he's so brutally honest not only in his work but also in interviews <laughs> that... yeah that it's very interesting that uh, so it would be interesting to have him and paul verhoven talk there you go see look we're we're booking like yeah. <laughs> the, the way that people talk about like fantasy fights we talk about like fantasy director fantasy meetups <laughs> yeah uh that's cool but uh, but yeah, I, I like I said, I needed to get that um, satire rant off my chest. So I appreciate you indulging me. And maybe you've changed my mind a little bit about like the ne the necessity of satire as a rhetorical device because it, it, I think it does work in certain circumstances, but maybe not necessarily yeah. everything needs to be satirized. Yeah, I think that is that's nuanced. Yeah. Mm hmm. Well, cool. I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap us up early for today so that you guys can get back to all that uh, good stuff that you guys enjoy so well. And of course, like I said, go check out Adam's breakdown of the new, um, you know, uh, uh, Requiem for Vengeance. Vengeance. I almost said Witch from Mercury kits. And I was like, no, no, wait, <laughs> Requiem for Vengeance kits. The, I, I think they're pretty cool. Yeah. I, I probably won't get the Gundam myself, but obviously Ooh. the Zaku I have to. <laughs> I'm going to tease you about this then. Okay. That's, that's the other heel thing I'll mess with you about is not liking that. Cause I definitely get in the Gundam EX. And the really? Zop, but for yeah. sure the Gundam. Interesting. <laughs> okay. We're going to have to have, we're follow up tomorrow. We're going to, we're going to debate this, which design yeah. is better, the Gundam EX or the uh, Zaku Solari. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much as always for your insight. And, oh, uh, yeah. sure. you know, I, I love when you can contribute like all these, amazing ideas about film and games in in these discussions because you know yeah it's fun to talk about this interviews. stuff <laughs> yeah we dive into things that we don't even think about and it's like hmm, interesting it helps me as someone that wants to be a storyteller so absolutely and i hope that uh i hope that you guys in the chat are getting some value out of it as well it looks like the result of the poll is that yes tomino is 91 percent a pretty big troll <laughs> yeah. i'm glad that you guys agree but uh, and of course, Tyler Lucas, don't forget to reach out to me about your kit. Otherwise, I will have to pick out mm. another winner for that. We are rapidly approaching 4000 subscribers here and I will be doing a 4000 subscriber giveaway. So, yeah, that is close. Um, yeah. Keep People. keep your uh, keep share this stay tuned for those details. Am I forgetting anything, Adam? No, no, that was a good one. Sweet. All right. Well, definitely tune in tomorrow for the Gundam Explained show. 
I will catch you all then. Yep. Until then, have a good rest of your day. See y'all. Cheers.